In this video, I'll show how to build a circuit to measure inductance. Inductors play a huge role in my build projects. Chokes, transformers, antennas, electromagnets, and probably more that I'm not thinking of right now. What all of these have in common is that they've got a relatively large amount of inductance, and I almost always need to know what that value is. This is a little more complicated than measuring capacitance, which can be done simply by charging a capacitor and measuring the discharge time. Up till now, I've been measuring inductance with this cheap meter I got off Amazon, which is pretty handy overall, but it's not terribly accurate, and it has terrible resolution below about 1 millihenry, so I'd like a better solution, especially since I work with so many inductors in the single-digit microhenry range. Measuring an inductor involves either setting up some sort of LC tank oscillator or measuring LC resonance by flowing current through the inductor, then quickly cutting it off and observing the ringing frequency in parallel with the capacitor. My circuit will be doing the latter. Now the quick and dirty way to do this would be to simply stick a capacitor in parallel with an inductor, run a very small current through the inductor with a bench supply, and then quickly cut it off. The problem is that produces a very erratic result because manually unplugging the power supply cable produces a response that pretty much looks the same as switch bounce as you can see here. The next best thing would be to connect the inductor and capacitor to a switch that has some debounce and pulse it. This would probably work okay, but if I'm going to bother putting together a separate circuit, I want to take the power supply out entirely and go a step further in filtering jitter out of the switching. The bulletproof solution to switching without noise or jitter is a transistor latch, which is formed by a PNP and NPN transistor. When a small current is applied to the base of the NPN transistor, it pulls down the base of the PNP transistor, causing it to conduct. The PNP transistor provides even more base current to the NPN transistor, which in turn pulls even more base current through the PNP transistor, causing a positive feedback loop that almost immediately drives both transistors into saturation. Even when the original trigger current is removed, both transistors continue to conduct, and the only way to shut them off is to starve the current below a certain critical value to stop the feedback loop. The cutoff current depends on the transistor gain and whatever biasing resistors may be present. Here's what that looks like in my circuit. It's also worth mentioning that this transistor combination is actually the equivalent circuit of a thyristor, which is also called an SCR, or silicon controlled relay. The thyristor is made up of a PNPN junction with the trigger current flowing through the second P junction. If we expand that out, you can see that it's actually the same as a PNP and NPN transistor wired together as I've done in my circuit. Here's the actual circuit. As you can see, when I hit the trigger, the output of the latch goes high, but repeatedly triggering doesn't cause it to change state. It's only possible to shut off the latch with a separate reset switch. I wanted this mode of switching because I didn't want to accidentally send multiple pulses, which could still occur even if switch jitter was removed with a debound circuit. Next, I'll connect a capacitor to the latch output, and the other side will be connected to ground by a 10K resistor. Without the resistor, the capacitor would just short the transient current to ground, but with the resistor, as you can see, there's a gradual decay of the voltage. No matter how long the latch is left on, only one start pulse will ever cross the capacitor because of the AC coupling. Now let's replace that 10K resistor with a 100K potentiometer, and that should give us some ability to control the voltage fall time of the capacitor. Here's the fall time of the full 100K, which is about 11 milliseconds. If I dial the pot all the way back, you can see how the pulse duration is dramatically shorter. Having the ability to select the pulse duration will really come in handy. Now we need to take the pulse waveform and convert it to a square wave. To do this, I'll use a Schmidt trigger. The Schmidt triggers I had in my collection were the inverting type, so I had to have two channels in series to uninvert the output, but if you have non-inverting types, you just need one channel. As you can see, it's cleaned things up quite a bit. Here's the minimum resistance coming in about 260 microseconds and maximum resistance coming in about 7.8 milliseconds. That should be plenty of range to provide a pulse for testing, which will probably be around the neighborhood of one millisecond. Next, I'll add a MOSFET that the Schmidt trigger's output will drive and do a test with a one ohm resistor and five volts of input. Looks pretty clean, just a slight curve right at the beginning and that's probably from the gate voltage on the MOSFET passing through the turn on threshold. Now that I've verified the MOSFET control is working correctly, I'll place a 47 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with the test inductor's connector, which is a pair of screw terminals. I also have a diode on the input of the MOSFET to prevent reverse current from going through it when the circuit rings, 
and this 4148 diode is just here to break down before the maximum VDS of 100 volt is reached in order to save the MOSFET. Let's hook up a sample inductor and probe the voltage across it when a pulse is sent. 82.2 kHz, which equates to about 80 microhenries. Seems pretty believable by just eyeballing it. How about this big one? 22.8 kHz, which equates to about 1.04 millihenries. Looks like everything is working as intended, so I'll break the controls out to external buttons and switches to mount in an enclosure. The 5 volts for the circuit will be provided by three AA batteries, which will make the tester independent of a bench supply and eliminate the annoying switching noise from my power supply, which it has because it's cheap and Chinese. The controls will be mounted on this panel. The board and the batteries will slide into this box and the control panel will be fastened to it with some number 4 screws. Here's what the finished product looks like. Here's the complete schematic for the device. Power is provided by a toggle switch and an LED illuminates to indicate power is on. This is actually really useful for me personally because otherwise I'd forget it's on and drain the battery. Next we've got the latch circuit I went over earlier and the Schmidt trigger to clean up the pulse and use it to drive the MOSFET. Then I've added a 1 nanofarad capacitor in parallel with the test inductor and the 47 nanofarad capacitor can be toggled on and off. The ability to switch down to a lower capacitance value will be useful for situations where the LC resonance is damped out before multiple oscillations can occur. The other controls I've added are resistor toggles. By default, 680 ohms limits the maximum test current, but the lower the value of an inductor, the more current it'll need to produce a readable voltage oscillation during ringing. So the option to toggle 220, 100, and 10 ohm resistors was added. Alright, let's try our sample inductor from previously. This time, I'm using the 680 ohm input. As you can see, the amplitude is relatively small, coming in at about half a volt peak to peak. Still readable, but I'd like a little more clarity, so I'll toggle the 220 ohm input and you can see that now the ringing amplitude has increased from half a volt to about 1.8 volts. This is a particularly important feature for very low value inductors. If I disconnect the 47 nanofarad capacitor from the circuit, leaving me with just one nanofarad, you can see how much higher the frequency is, 6.9 times higher to be exact. You may also notice that the oscillation damps out much faster. This is because I used a very cheap capacitor that probably has a relatively large ESR. In the future, I should probably swap it for a higher quality, low ESR cap. Let's see if I can measure this microwave transformer. This is a lot of turns on a huge hunk of iron, so it'll probably have a pretty large inductance. I'm going to have my input resistance set to 680 and my capacitor set to 1 nanofarad for this one. 57.5 kilohertz on 1 nanofarad, which corresponds to approximately 7.7 .7 millihenries. That may not seem like much, but the winding resistance is less than an ohm, and these transformers can easily sustain 20 amps on the primary without saturating, which equates to a ton of energy transfer at 60 Hz. Next I'll try this electromagnet I wound on my coil winding machine. Check out the link below if you want to see how that was built. Knowing the inductance of this magnet would definitely be important to know how fast it could be switched on or off for something like a levitator or coil gun. Here I'm using 220 ohms and 1 nanofarad. I get 77.4 kilohertz, which equates to 4.2 millihenries. Okay, let's look at something on the opposite end of the spectrum. I'm going to make a simple air cord coil by winding a few turns of 24 gauge wire on this marker. A tiny coil like this might be used for an oscillator or filter on an analog radio. As you can see, when I try to read it on my meter, it doesn't even recognize there's any inductance, just the winding resistance, so I wouldn't be able to determine the inductance without my tester. For this test, I'm toggling all the resistors up for minimum input resistance and setting my capacitance to 1 nanofarad. The circuit rings at 1.94 MHz, which corresponds to 6.7 microhenries. Knowing inductance down to such a small value will be particularly valuable for radio applications. Now if you don't have an oscilloscope, you're probably finding all this pretty disappointing, but it can still be done with relatively inexpensive hardware. By AC coupling the output voltage and connecting it to a comparator op-amp, zero crossing points could be detected which could be then read by an Arduino board and translated into frequency and inductance with a little bit of math in your software. 
The only caveat is that you might need some form of amplification if the ringing amplitude was relatively weak, or conversely, some Dezener diodes to protect the comparator inputs in case the ringing amplitude went beyond the maximum input voltage. Anyway, I hope you found this helpful. Thanks for watching.